The struggle is real. ETH and Bitcoin are now, I believe, in a great prize fight for who is going to be the alpha dominant one in the crypto space. Today, we're going to dive into it today. My name is Paul Barron. This is TechPath. Thanks for coming back, guys. We appreciate it. And thanks for the great growth on the channel. You guys have helped us really kind of accelerate and give us really an idea as to what we should be doing in terms of topic content. So we thought, hey, let's just feed the beast today and have no other than Mr. Rob Wolf back on the show here from, of course, Digital Asset News. Great to have you, Rob. Great to be back, Paul. The first one was, was great. I was happy to hear <laughs> from you. Let's do this again. You bet. All right, Rob. So ETH and Bitcoin, a little bit of a, a boxing match going on here in terms of where Bitcoin is standing in its market dominance. And then also ETH making some slight moves with trading volumes accelerated over the past couple of weeks. What is your play on this? Why do you think we're seeing some of this move um, from? I, I mean, I, I, you're not a Bitcoin maximalist, are you? Uh, no, I. What, okay. Well, I didn't want to offend you. Man. Yeah, no, yeah, exactly. It's it's almost a super religion these days. But yeah, go ahead. Yeah. But no, I I think um, so. There's there are some weird things going on in the market right now, right? We just saw a pretty hefty decline in the price action of all crypto and digital assets just go down, even right. though we had massively great news. Uh, from all these different countries that were starting to adopt it. The, uh, even, even the great state of Texas that I live in, Governor Greg Abbott came out and said, hey, I'm going to sign into law this, uh, this new master plan for blockchain. If, and all these different things that are happening, you think that in 2017, if this would have happened, we would have lost our minds and it would have gone exactly. up even more so. But in 2021, what happens? <sighs> Starts to go down. Mm. So it's mm. an interesting situation. So what I think... if if, if we just take a look at what Ethereum is going on right now, is because of all the DeFi, the DeFi projects, all the, the TVL, everything that's locked up into those projects, because it's not that everybody understands exactly what it is, but everybody hears the words DeFi and Ethereum. And what right. they think to themselves is, I need to get into that. Does everybody understand Theta? Does everybody understand Solana? Does everybody understand, I mean, any, any of these cryptocurrencies, they usually, nobody really, I mean, a lot of people don't, but they just say, I hear those words, I want to be into that. So they get into Ethereum <laughs> yeah. and they say, you know what, if I want to transact and get any of these other types of tokens that are low cap gems, I need Ethereum first to, to buy into them, to go into the Uniswap, the Zero Exchange and all these different places. So I need to get into this and just kind of buy out. So I think that's part of the reason also because EIP 1559 is coming up and that is supposedly supposed to drop the gas fees. And that is one of the biggest hindrances right now of right. Ethereum. However, we just heard uh, Vitalik Buterin was talking on a conference and he said, look, uh, ETH 2.0 took a lot longer than what I thought because mm -hmm. there's a lot of, not, not with the technology itself, but just getting people together and working with people to make this thing actually work. And uh, so we'll see if EIP 1559 is the grand savior of uh, the gas fees and everything else, uh, hopefully, because uh, I'm an ETH holder and uh, I'm hoping that uh, it works out. All right. So I want to jump over to uh, coin market cap real quick and just kind of look at um, the into the block data. And if you look at their concentration here by large holders, 42 percent, this is. This was significant to me when you look at where yeah, Ethereum is Ethereum is gone. So that tells me that a lot of big players are coming in. My question is, is this coming in from some of the um, the bigger Bitcoin investors? Are they are either one, are they re-strengthening or uh, shifting their positions? Or is this simply saying, hey, listen, I'm looking at uh, diversifying a little bit and I'm going to move into Ethereum because it obviously ETH is the the second major dog in the hunt here or do you feel like there is a shift in the in the wallets moving over because that's kind of the question on that one. I don't, what are your thoughts i think it's i think it's everything that you just talked about because even you can ask most of the bitcoin maximalists out there and just say you know why do you love bitcoin so much why well, i love it because you know it's the first Satoshi and they're going to tell you all these different things about how great it is but if you really dig down to them and say, do you own any other type of cryptocurrency? Oh, well, yeah, I own a little bit of this and that. Not every single maximalist is going to say that. But if you're a responsible investor, to just go all in on one different assets, I don't think that's a prudent 
uh, investment strategy for right. you. I think a little diversification goes a long way. So if you take a look at what is one of the hottest topics or the hottest different things that are out there, again, I think people will hear, they'll hear Bitcoin. And recently it hasn't been too positive, especially with that uh, colonial pipeline ransomware yep. issue that came up. And uh, the second thing they're going to hear about, uh, of course, is Ethereum. Even we've got Mark Cuban who came out and said that uh, uh, he was he bought a ton or his company bought a ton of Matic, which is a uh, layer two solution for Ethereum. So pretty sure he's also getting into Ethereum because he understands uh, exactly what is needed there. So I think it's that. I think maybe a little bit of reshifting. And again, if you look at what's going to happen coming up with Ethereum, Ethereum 2.0, 1559. So these are two big events that could really shift things in that favor. Uh, that's why I think for Ethereum. Do you think that with um, what Vitalik was talking about in terms of the slowdown in rolling out uh, 2.0, do you think that's going to have any kind of a factor? You feel like just Ethereum so strong in its, its infrastructure and what it's really about that the potential now is just a, it's a waiting game. As long as it doesn't, you know, as, as long as it's not on Elon time. <laughs> yeah. We're, we're going to get there. I don't, I don't know that guy. So, so yeah, I, I will tell you uh, one thing that I look at it this, this way is that if Ethereum was the only player in town for smart contracts, then I would say it really wouldn't matter. However, right. I mean, Paul, we've both been in business, right? The big, my big worry that keeps me up at night is competition. How can I build a moat around my business to make mm -hmm. sure that I minimize the competition? I can't eliminate it, but I, I, I minimize yeah. it. So these days with an avalanche, with a polka dot, with a Tezos, with Cardano yeah. coming out in August with their smart contract rolling out with the, the Alonzo protocol, they got to really think to themselves, I need to get this done now as soon as possible yeah. because it's not, it, it, they don't have to completely fall by the wayside. But if you have all these different companies taking a little bit of your market share, 1% here, 3% there, that adds up. And uh, that's, I think, what they should probably be a little concerned about. Yeah, for sure. I want to jump over back to coin market cap because you can kind of see uh, Ethereum's volume right here. BTC at 42.6, ETH hovering in at 18.6. This is actually down a little bit. This was up around 20% earlier in the week. So I don't know if this trend is going to continue to hold. But the point was is that we were continuing to see this movement right here in Bitcoin and ETH. And do you think the flippening is a real thing? Do you feel like this is something, because there are many analysts that are pointing to this happening out later in the, in the season, around into summer, that we literally uh, could see a flippening in terms of the ETH valuation and ETH volume uh, superseding what's happening in Bitcoin? Thoughts on I will, that? Here's my, well, if it's a great question. And my, <laughs> Uh, my is friend the Ryan flipping Gorman, real? <laughs> is the, yeah, is the flipping real? My friend Ryan Gorman over at Trade the Chain is, he's pretty big on Ethereum. And he's like, it's going to happen, it's going to happen, it's going to happen. And before yesterday, I would probably think to myself, you know, it could actually happen with, especially what's going on, what we just talked about. Yeah. And all the negative news that we've gotten with Bitcoin. And the problem with this, this negative news is, first of all, you had President Trump came out and said, it's a scam. And then I think he said in another interview, it's a scam. And whether if you think he's relevant or not, hence he's still relevant to a lot of people. So when they hear that and yeah. they go, it's a scam, he's a professional businessman, I don't want to get into that argument uh, on this show, uh, but they'll take heed, they'll listen to him. And then on top of that, like we talked about that colonial pipeline uh, ransomware, it looked in the beginning that the FBI was able to hack Bitcoin. That's what the uh, NBC, yeah. CNBC, we're talking that about, was a little was misleading to me I, when I when I dove into the rest of the story. The headlines, yes. it, yeah, it's bait clicky. I understand what they're trying to do, but clearly not well, the way that it happened. Well, we know we know what they're trying to do, right? <laughs> but uh, but yeah, it's so. Before yesterday, I would have said, you know what, it could have, it could definitely happen. However, with that news with El Salvador coming out and not only saying that they were going to. Uh, push Bitcoin through as their legal tender for the entire country, which is six and a half million people. Uh, right. They actually did it today. Mm. So yep. it passed through through legislation. It was uh, it, it was passed into law. And now, if you are 
Uh, the government will is going to control the flow of Bitcoin. They're going to make sure that merchants can must accept Bitcoin for every shop and business that is in El Salvador, and they're going to make a run of it. And on top of that, they're also going to meet with the IMF on Thursday, which was just mm -hmm. confirmed by the president yep. uh, this morning. So if you take a look at all that and go, no country wants to be first to do this, right? Just like no big uh, company wants to be the first to implement uh, Bitcoin, but nobody wants to be the last. And I think this right. could be a domino effect. So I don't think that there's a flipping happening anytime soon. I know Ethereum Maximus will be like, you're a moron. Well, debatable. But uh but I just don't see it happening anytime soon, especially if more countries start to implement it, like we've seen on Paraguay. Congress has been asking questions, also in Bolivia and Colombia. And um, who knows if this becomes a reserve asset for the first central bank, who knows? Okay, so I actually think the situation with Trump was a good thing in the sense that one, he's a little bit out there. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it, and I don't want to I don't want to say this in a bad way, but there are certain demographic that probably is not a crypto investor. And then there's a demographic that are crypto investors. And uh, even though I do see a, a lot of conservatives in the in the crypto space, but at the same time, I feel this might be maybe I don't know. Sometimes I feel like he's head faking all the time, you know, to, to play an angle. So you just you know, could this be a scenario? Are we trying to get Bitcoin down to 25K? And then, you know, everybody rushes in and, and buys mm -hmm. on the super dip. Well, so I'm, I don't know. It's, it, it is a great point. And it's, it's in my comment section. There's always the chatter about, but Rob, the whales and manipulation. And they do it all because of <laughs> da, da, da. Right. And then there's this right. Riddler and he wore an X, which means it's XRP. And I'm like, ugh, whatever. But in all, in all honesty, I mean, how hard would it be for a group of investors to get together and go, hey, you know what? We really like this Bitcoin. We'd like to get into it. And uh, maybe if someone somewhere could just say something negative about it, just so we can get in at 25K, if we just knew some person or person, somebody, somebody, yeah. I mean, just, just something. And then throw some FUD, throw some FUD out there, man. <laughs> and then, but like, like I said in my video yesterday, I said, hey, these whales and manipulators, their, their time's coming. Their time's coming. And I think there's only so much you can manipulate. And I think with, not to beat a dead horse, but with what happened with El Salvador, and what is happening, hopefully other countries, there may come a point where it doesn't matter how much FUD you say or what you talk about it. You're like, the truth is the truth and the fundamentals are the fundamentals. And you have right. to get into Bitcoin. You have to respect uh, the different positions that are being held. And uh, that's what I'm waiting for. So uh, we'll see. Yeah, well, I think the I th I'm expecting the next uh, shoe to drop on El Salvador in the sense that we're probably going to see mainstream media come at this and say, listen, El Salvador is one of the biggest drug capitals in the world. We've just given them, you know, a vehicle that is untraceable. They have this new whole ecosystem now being built into their entire government. It's only setting up Bitcoin for the criminals even further. And I, of course, I don't necessarily believe that, but I look at that as how, what's the next chess move for mainstream media to kind of go in and, and develop a FUD. Now, I look at it as El Salvador is one of the dominoes in South America that could start really dropping the rest of those countries. And if you get someone like Argentina or Mexico, or even to the extent maybe Costa Rica involved in cryptocurrency, I mean, this is where it's gonna really get interesting, interesting. if South America becomes the global leader <laughs> on moving to a digital currency. Wouldn't that be something? You know, to where they're essentially going head to head with the Chinese. Yeah. And I, I think it's interesting just what you said. And I didn't think about it, but now it makes a lot of sense. Let's say that the, the mainstream media does come out and they say, you know what? You can track everything. And they're able to, to play both sides of the fence, even mm -hmm. though yesterday they were just talking about how, how trackable Bitcoin was because they were, the FBI was able to snag these, uh, these hackers from this colonial pipeline issue. So it's amazing how they'll, they'll do like one thing on this side, another thing on that side for whatever the narrative is. And whether there is a, a deeper agenda or just clickbait, who knows? But uh, this is why it's so important to have shows like yours, Paul, yeah. and yeah. shows like mine and the different uh, people and individuals or, and even companies out there that are trying to spread honest information about what cryptocurrency is, what digital assets can do, and how things are going to radically change over the next one, three, five, 20 years using this new right. technology. And this is why it's so important we do, do what we do. Yeah, and I don't think uh, mainstream media has really uh, allocated for the crypto Twitter and crypto YouTube. 
uh, which yeah. essentially has pretty much taken over. If you look at the growth channels on YouTube and where it's going, YouTube algorithms are really starting to pick this up. I'm curious as to whether or not the algorithm starts going to look at this a little differently. That'll be interesting to see uh, because I think that's going to be something, and I've heard you know many channel managers out there in the space that are talking about this right now. That they're you know they're concerned that there may be even be some uh, scenarios there. Uh, obviously, with Twitter, it's a, I feel a little bit a little bit more in neutral uh, territory because Dorsey's in there. He's a very pro, uh, you know, cryptocurrency person, blockchain. I think eventually Twitter is going to kind of get to that, even though the new Twitter blue is ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. You know, I think, I think if you take a look at who are the advertisers, who are the advertisers on YouTube? Well, there's, I mean, there's just a huge plethora of different advertisers that want to be, want to put ads on the channel. And that's what makes YouTube go around. Let's just call a spade yeah. a spade. And uh, just like those managers had talked about, I can see, definitely see their argument. But I will say on the flip side, you know, Google just approved for exchanges uh, yeah. to be able I to advertise on the Google platform. And at first I thought yep. this is awful because Lord knows that uh, we have so many scam ads <laughs> right. on YouTube right before our videos. But they made it a point to say that if you want to do this, there has to be a couple requirements. One of those is you have to be a member of FinCEN. And another mm -hmm. thing is, I forgot what it is. It's, oh, a banking license. So ah, scammers- That's gonna eliminate a bunch. Yes, so scammers can't come out and, and just be like what they do with YouTube, because if they wanna be on AdWords and things like that, it'll be a little bit different. Now, I'd hope that YouTube would go in that route as well, because, you know, Google and YouTube, and then they can get rid of all these, these, uh, uh, these scams, uh, scam yeah. ads at that play. So I think, I think actually, as time goes on, you're gonna see a lot of advertisers who are in crypto space move into not just on AdWords, but in YouTube and start to really take right. shape, even more than eToro and all the different ones. Yeah, and the reason I say this is because it applies back into Ethereum and some of the key mm -hmm. uh, crypto assets that are out there. And this is, a, I, we talked about this on the, the other day on my show, and that was that some projects do a really good job at either strategically placing these little milestones in front of them. And I think, you know, if you look at what Hosk is doing over at Cardano yeah. and how he's been able to strate strategically place these little mind, you know, mind shell bombs mm -hmm. into his story of what is happening at Cardano. And then there's, then there's tokens like ICP, which is, uh, when I look at ICP, I think, God, this is, this is an amazing product that they are trying to bring to market. My concern with ICP is that it's coming out too early. But when you look yeah. back, in, in the sense of people don't understand it, it's like when Twitter first became a thing. Nobody knew what Twitter was, and there was only a handful of people on it, and mostly it was media. Mm -hmm. But nobody even understood it. You know, the personalities were definitely not there. Fun fact, at one time I was in the top 500 people on Twitter. Hey, look at that, Paul. <laughs> Make it and then, you know, then normal people came in. And, and I became, you know, <laughs> And normal 600,000. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But my point is, is that there's an opportunity here for Ethereum and Vitalik. I think they could really accelerate in turn, especially if they win out the day on getting the news and the kind of that, that whole approach toward getting good news around Ethereum. If we continue to see Bitcoin struggle over the summer, could we see Ethereum trading volumes continue to rise? And that's kind of curious. I want to jump to trade the chain here because this is an interesting one real quick. I want to kind of jump off. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to look here at Ethereum and I want to ask you because you read this all the time. And um, the tie in here we go. Uh, Ethereum coming in right here, June 2nd. Really great positive sentiment. It's tracking along. It starts to dip under a little bit. Sentiment starts to flow. Yeah. And it's moving fairly nicely. And then right here, we see this nice little sentiment pop, which is on June 7th when the uh, Trump hits and also El Salvador. Yeah, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. And this right here tells me, well, wait a minute. Are people concerned about Bitcoin because of that? And then all of a sudden we see this fall off right here as well. So I'm just trying to follow along with sentiment and as I look at it, I, and again, this could have been trading volume uh, scenarios that started to move the needle here versus the the typical, you know, buy the rumor, sell the news kind of stuff. Yeah. But your thoughts on how sentiment plays into Ethereum's life cycle? It seems like Ethereum is one of those that really 
does respond to sentiment on uh, both Twitter and general media? Yeah, Your you thoughts? know, well, first of all, you know what's amazing? What's, what's amazing about Trade the Chain is that, that they actually put this together. And, uh, you know, Josh Frank from the Thai, uh, he was talking about this. He's the one that's, uh, uh, you know, co-created Trade the Chain with Alex Mascioli and Ryan and all those guys over there. But it's just interesting to me that they're able to track out the sentiment, you know, what is going on in the Twitterverse, what is being uh, put forth as far as like uh, the blog posts and the exchanges and to, and to compile all those things to give us like a real score and to say, this is the sentiment, this is where things are going. And it does, it, it yeah. pretty much follows uh, the, uh, the price action. So when I take a look at that, as far as sentiment goes, just like what you said uh, before, which makes, does make a lot of sense, is if people start to hear this negative news, and they're like, hmm, well, if Bitcoin is- Where can I diversify? Yeah, can I diversify? If Bitcoin was hacked, then where can I go? What's the next best thing? Well, Ethereum, I hear about Ethereum, it should be great, and then uh, mm -hmm. off you go. But, um, and then of course, volume plays a, a big factor. People are going to get into it. And just like we talked about before, what is interesting though, is that the, the sentiment score, if you can, I don't know if you can bring it up again, but yeah, let me pop it right over there. Just kind of Hang tails off. Second. And where are we? Uh, trade the chain right there. Okay, here we go. Yeah, sentiment score tails off right there. You can kind of see it. Let's jump to that screen on sentiment. Trade the chain, oh, right here, Very all right. Nice. So you can kind of see it starts to, let me zoom in on that up here. And, and right here, sentiment does tail off right here. Yeah, June, June 8th. 8th. What is What do we got today? June 9th. 2,500, right there. Do you think? And hmm. then it started dropping into the floor. We got it down to 2,400. Great price action here, which if you're a day trader would probably be a, a good place for entry. But the point being is, could we see it drop down, you know, back over here where we saw the pre seven day cycle, get yeah. it back into like the $2,200 range. Anyway, the point being is, is that mm -hmm. I feel like it, I feel like Ethereum is reacting more to these kinds of scenarios than even Bitcoin does to a certain extent. Bitcoin does react, but it seems to respond fairly quickly. Um, in the sense of, you know, now it's trading, I think Bitcoin is trading back up close to 35. Let's take a look. Well, yeah, Bitcoin's up 14% for in a 24 hour time frame, And then yeah. out, out of the top 10, uh, yeah. Ethereum is doing the worst with an increase of 7.69. So right. maybe it's just those people like what you talked about. I could see that, I could see why it is and uh, people just moving their, their money around. But again, like, like it says right there, bearish. That's interesting. Yep, bearish at 39. Yep. Yeah. Interesting. I don't know if I would uh, want to jump in now or wait a little bit later. But I mean, Ethereum in the long run, there's always two hats, right, Paul? You got your trader yep. hat and you got your, your long-term investor hat. If you're a trader, yep. as it kind of goes down, maybe this is a pretty good time to get into it, right? Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. um, might be, hopefully, maybe it can cool off a little bit before you get in there. Now, as far as a long-term investor, Bitcoin. By far. Ethereum yeah. Yeah. is like the safest of the most volatile asset in the world. But uh, yeah. I will just- Very cool. Yeah, I think, I think just like we talk about, Ethereum is pretty much moved by sentiment, but uh, you know, who knows why it went down. Maybe all the positive news that Bitcoin people are re reallocating. Right. So final word, flippening. You're, you're feeling a little weak on the flippening. Uh, I'm feeling a little bit more mm -hmm. neutral to positive that, it, that we could see some pretty good price action come here in the next few months. I mean, what are we, what are we talking about as far as like volume? Uh, because like the market cap, you're looking at what, 300 billion for Ethereum. Yeah. Market cap, 683 billion for, for Bitcoin. Can we really yep. do 383 billion plus to catch months. up, yeah. yeah. On top of that, with all the good news that just came out, we just talked about with Bitcoin. Can Ethereum really do that? I don't think it's going to do that. That would be a gargant. Listen, that would be one of the most. Uh, that'd be the, one of the biggest investment stories of the decade if that were to happen. Uh, absolutely, without a doubt.